Thanks a lot, Chris, for the nice introduction, and thanks to uh, the Lifetime Consortium for allowing me to uh, present our, uh, or giving you an overview over the organoid field here. So uh, I'm a developmental uh, neurobiologist, and uh, I'm fascinated by what I think is the most exciting organ that nature has generated, which is the um, human brain. Now, as you all know, the human brain is incredibly complex. 87 billion neurons have to be born at the right time, migrate to the right position, and then wire up in the right way in order to allow us to think as we are able to do. But unfortunately, this complexity comes at a price. Uh, it is now thought that mental illness is the leading cause of disability and uh, impairment uh, in the United States. There is about 25% of the population that at some point uh, suffers from a mental uh, illness. But uh, uh, in contrast to this uh, incredibly strong medical need, the current therapeutics uh, are far from ideal. Most of them actually go back to functional principles that have been developed uh, many, many years ago. Uh, they have been improved, but there's not many truly new therapeutic uh, principles. And it is acknowledged that um, a mental illness is a therapeutic area with the lowest success rate at all stages. Now, there's many reasons for this, um, but one of them is clearly that the conventional animal models that we use in uh, testing compounds and uh, treating disease uh, are not as successful in the brain as they are for other organs. And one particularly striking example is shown here. This is a patient who suffers from very severe microcephaly. As you can see, the patient's brain is severely reduced in size when you compare it to that of a healthy patient. This patient carries a loss of function mutation in a gene that's called NDE1. And NDE1 is conserved all the way from yeast to humans. But when you make the corresponding mutation in the mouse, there is in no way this severe reduction in brain volume and only a very weak um, phenotype. So although the mouse is an absolutely fantastic model system that has taught us a lot about development and disease. It has its limitations when it comes to neurodevelopmental disorders. And to overcome this problem, a um, couple of years ago, Madeleine Lancaster, when she was a postdoc in my lab, developed a method that we can use to generate human brain tissue in the lab, start, starting from pluripotent stem cells, and to then use these uh, in vitro organoid cultures to study human neurodevelopmental disorders. And the method that she developed is uh, illustrated here. So we start with pluripotent stem cell colonies, either ES cells or IPS cells, which we then dissociate. Then we take about five to 8,000 of these um, cells and we simply put them into a 96-well plate where they will sink down, they will aggregate and they will form what's called an embryoid body that contains the three germ layers, but then we change the medium into a neural induction medium and we end up with these balls of neuroectoderm, which we then uh, embed in droplets of matrigel, where uh, we culture them first in suspension culture and then on an orbital shaker or in a spinning bioreactor. And what we see over time is that the cells inside these organoids start to sort out in a way so that they form shapes that is very typical for the developing human brain. They form the so-called ventricular zone where the cells divide first symmetrically, then asymmetrically. The neurons migrate out to start and initiate the formation of what is called a cortical plate, and we end up with this tissue architecture that essentially resembles the development of a human cortex. So there is a ventricular zone here, which is where the progenitor cells are. There's a cortical plate out here, which is where the neurons are. There are other brain areas, like the choroid plexus, or more posterior brain regions. Um, and so we recapitulate key morphogenic uh, events that occur also during human brain development. These are two examples of cerebral organoids here. There's a developing human cortex here. Here's a lateral ventricle. In this example, you find cortical tissue here and here and here. We actually see the development uh, of a human eye. Um, this uh, is the, the neuronal activity of these uh, organoids. The neurons in cerebral organoids fire spontaneous action uh, potentials that can be visualized by calcium imaging. These uh, calcium spikes are highly non-random and uh, paired neurons and anti-correlated 
um, neurons and to appreciate the complexity of the neural networks that are formed in the organoids, we recently developed a clearing method uh, that we can use to make the organoids transparent in a very rapid 24-hour protocol that does not use any toxic chemicals. And this allows us to generate movies like this one, where we've labeled the progenitor cells in red and the neurons in uh, white. And you can see that the progenitors arrange in this um, ventricular zone, and they then start to form very complex neuronal networks. I should say this is sparse labeling, so only 1% of the neurons are actually labeled. Uh, and you can appreciate the enormous complexity of uh, these neural networks. So we can, new, uh, we can recapitulate brain morphogenic uh, events, starting from iPS cells using uh, brain organoid technology. Um, so what can we do with it? In my view, we are currently experiencing a complete revolution in the way we do biomedical um, research. And that's because we have more and more complete human genome sequences. We can generate pluripotent stem cells from any of the patients from which we have complete sequences. We can then use these iPS cells to generate a huge variety of different tissues and organs in vitro. And then we can use modern gene editing technologies like CRISPR-Cas to introduce any mutation, to repair any mutation, uh, or to introduce a patient-specific mutation into another genetic background. And this allows us for the first time to analyze the genetics of human disorders in a human setting. And one example uh, of this is shown here, where we have analyzed a patient who suffers from severe microcephaly. You can see the patient's brain is severely reduced in size compared to that of an age-matched healthy patient. We um, uh, um, uh, obtain cells from this patient, use them to, um, to do reprogramming, generate iPS cells, and then use those to generate cerebral organoids. This is a healthy organoid. There's a nice ventricular zone differentiating neurons, but in the patient-derived organoids, the ventricular zone is much smaller, and there's many uh, less neurons, and so the organoid is much smaller. We can go back in history, and we identified that there is a defect in lineage specification that's responsible for this disorder. Normally, during organoid development, the cells initially expand in a series of symmetric, expansive divisions, but these divisions cannot be sustained in the patient-derived organoids because the organoids have a defect in a gene that uh, is required for the precise orientation of the um, division plane. We can then repair that mutation and bring back both the neuronal differentiation pattern and the size of the organoid. So we can use cerebral organoids to model neurodevelopmental disorders, to analyze the mechanism of these disorders, but also to unambiguously associate particular DNA mutations with those um, disorders. Now, microcephaly is a very rare disorder, but it recently had caused a lot of um, attention because uh, it is associated with the uh, Zika virus. The Zika virus was endemic in Africa for the longest time. It then appeared in Indonesia, then in French Polynesia, and in 2015 it became endemic in Brazil, right around the time of the Summer um, Olympics. At around the same time, there was a very sharp increase in the number of babies that were born with uh, microcephaly, and that led to the hypothesis that actually Zika virus infection in the pregnant mother would be responsible for this disorder. But the real evidence that the Zika virus is causally related to microcephaly was actually um, um, done by um, uh, using cerebral organoids. So these are normal organoids. They grow to a size of about one millimeter at, at during a certain time span. But when they are treated with physiological doses of the Zika virus, there's this enormous um, growth defect in the organoids. Um, and work from many labs, including uh, Hong Jung Song, Gu Li Ming, and Patricia Garces, has uh, then used the system to show that the Zika virus is specific for uh, fetal brain progenitors, uh, and uh, it can infect the fetal brain because there's many proliferating cells, whereas in the adult cells, there's uh, only neurons which are not infected by the, by the virus, but in the fetal brains, the uh, infected progenitors will then generate neurons, and ultimately, the virus will induce cell death in those um, neurons. So um, cerebral organoids can not only be used to test uh, genetic disorders, but also to test disorders that uh, have been induced by pathogenic 
agents. But can we actually use the organoid system to suggest potential strategies? For this, we have screened through a number of uh, chemo chemokines where, where we uh, deliberately first infect the organoids in only after two days, which is the time when the mother will actually realize that she has been infected. We start a certain treatment. We've tested multiple uh, 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 components. Some of them do not work, but we've identified at least two which uh, bring back the growth of the organoid and almost completely eliminate the cell death that you normally see in Zika virus infected um, organoids. We also use the same treatment in a mouse model. Normally, mice do not uh, get microcephaly from Zika virus infection, but you can inject the virus into the brain of newborn babies that causes massive cell death. But when you treat with certain chemokines, uh, the uh, virus is completely eliminated and the cell death is prevented. So we can use organoids not only to recapitulate diseases, but also to test certain therapeutic um, strategies. One place where this has become particularly um, um, important is uh, brain cancer, which is clearly the most deadly of all brain disorders. We have generated a model, an organoid model for brain tumorigenesis, and we do this by electroporating a cocktail of plasmids into organoids that we can use to stably label the cells with uh, GFP, ex overexpress any oncogene, and at the same time induce any tumor suppressor mutation we like. And by screening through a whole series of uh, different uh, mutant combinations, we generated models for several types of tumors, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, but also a glioblastoma. Here you see a typical glioblastoma organoid. There's uh, over-proliferating cells, which are positive for uh, GFP because they have been electroporated. The cells become invasive, and the edge of the organoid, they start to invade the um, neighboring cells. And we can recapitulate the gene expression pattern and marker expression pattern of um, a glioblastoma. We can also take these organoids and put them into a host mouse and generate an organoid a xenograft, um, uh, uh, which we can also use to uh, investigate the organoids. And finally, we can use these tumor organoids to test specific um, compounds for their effects on organoids in a mutation-specific manner. And the idea of this is to recapitulate the mutation spectrum of individual patients and then test the effect of particular compounds in a patient-specific manner. Now, so far, I've shown you experiments that were done with individual uh, brain organoids. But one of the key disadvantages in our, our organoid model is that the different areas of the uh, human brain develop in a random fashion in these organoids. And so we ask, can we bring a bit of order um, into this? And that's very important because many developmental effects, like the formation of all the interneurons in our cortex, requires the precise interaction between different areas. So interneurons are born in the ventral part, and they migrate over long distances to integrate into the dorsal cortex. And inter lack of interneurons causes epilepsy. And so many epilepsy genes actually affect uh, cell migration. And to overcome this randomness, we developed a protocol where we, use a, where we generate a dorsal cortex and a ventral cortex, and then we fuse the two parts together. They completely fuse with each other, and if I wouldn't show you the two colors here, you would not be able to, uh, to, to recognize the border. I should say this method was independently developed in the lab of um, Sergio Pasca, but it allows us to visualize for the first time the migration of um, human interneurons. Human interneuron migration is a very complex uh, process that, by the way, is a lot more complex in humans when you compare it to the uh, mouse because the distance the neurons have to migrate is a lot uh, further. And we've already tested several uh, compounds on this uh, to, 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 to identify uh, uh, compounds that might affect the process. But the actual reason why I show you this is because this is the basis for the next frontier in uh, organoid research. I think one of the next developments in the field will be the in vitro regeneration and recapitulation of entire brain uh, circuits. And what I show you here is two fused organoids where the axons have been labeled. And you can see that the labeled part extends a lot of axons into the unlabeled uh, part. These um, axons later on will fuse together and recapitulate the formation of complete axonal uh, tracts. And so the vision of the field that has been outlined in this review by Sergio uh, Pasca is that we can 
regenerate the individual parts that together reconstitute a particular circuit, we can then optogenetically activate uh, one of the organoid parts. We can then probe the effect on gene expression by using single cell RNA-seq in the other part of the organoid. And finally, record from uh, 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 other parts electrically or use um, uh, uh, a GCAMP or other calcium imaging methods to uh, test the effect of these excitations in an um, optical way. And ultimately, we hope that this will allow us, not in one organoid, but in multiple organoid uh, models, to regenerate particular uh, circuits that are important for the function um, of the human brain. Now, so far I've only told you about the advantages of the organoids. I also would like to tell you what the current limitations are. Uh, one of the clear and, 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 and most important limitations is that organoids at the moment do not contain blood vessels uh, and they do not contain an immune system. There are several ongoing attempts to overcome these problems. A simple way to in, in, enter vascularization is to mix them with endothelial cells. This has been done, this is possible, uh, but it doesn't recapitulate the formation of blood vessels. Um, uh, 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 for the uh, immune system, however, this is fairly easy. One can generate microglia cells in vitro, mix them into organoids, and they will behave in a way that is very similar uh, to in vivo. Um, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss with you afterwards uh, what are the currently ongoing attempts to induce um, vascularization. Another a uh, clear limitation in the organoid is that the, one, the, the individual organoids at the moment develop in a random fashion. They don't have any clearly visible um, polarity. But again, I think the solution to this is to combine organoids with uh, microfluidics. And uh, I think we will hear later from Paul Volto uh, something about the, 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 how bioengineers can help us to um, uh, induce polarity in uh, organoids. But finally, one of the key limitations of organoids is their variability. These are two typical organoids, and you can see that although all of them contain a ventricular zone um, and a cortical plate, the overall shape is very variable. And we've recently managed to at least diminish this variability by combining organoids with engineered scaffolds. So our organoids are round, in the beginning, but this is very different from an actual human embryo. Humans, in contrast to mice, develop from an embryonic disc. Uh, and to recapitulate this uh, shape, we used fibers that are made of a biocompatible um, chemical called PLGA, uh, and that we use and just throw into the uh, culture when we generate the organoids. The ES cells will then align along those fibers, and this will lead to the formation of elongated organoids. Now, the reason why this is, this is actually very good for us is because we're actually inter interested in the ectoderm, which is on the outside of these organoids. And um, so the elongated shape has a lower surface to volume uh, ratio, which is good for um, ectoderm development. Indeed, that worked. We generate these elongated um, organoids, and in red are the regions that are successfully patterned into forebrain, and you can see that the yield is much higher um, in these NCORE organoids. So with this, I hope I've been able to uh, tell you about the uh, achievements, the current limitations, and the future developments of this uh, cerebral organoid field. I didn't talk much about single-cell RNA-seq, but that's for two reasons. First of all, um, um, because um, um, Barbara Treutland later will give a talk that is entirely dedicated to this um, um, topic. And second, because the pioneering work in single cell rna has been done by um, other labs. But I do want to mention that uh, cerebral organoids contain a composition of cell types that is actually very similar to the actual uh, human brain. And single cell rna has now become key for the analysis of uh, organoids. Typical experiments now uh, include the generation of pathogenic uh, mutations, the formation of organoids from the deceased patients, and then a single cell RNA seq to ask what's the ratio of individual cell types and what's 
uh, uh, is the changes in gene expression pattern in individual uh, cell types. And one of the key advantages and why single cell technologies are so interesting for people working with organoids is because they get rid of this variability. We can just take, grow different batches of organoids, put them all together, and then do single cell RNA-seq, and the, the differences between the individual batches will be um, leveled out. And so organoids have already been used to uh, address the differences between uh, primate and human brain development, but I think we'll hear from uh, Barbara um, about this. So in the end, I just wanted to quickly mention that the uh, organoid protocol has originally, originally been developed by Madeleine Lancaster uh, in my lab. She's now at the LMB in Cambridge. Uh, Josh Begley de developed the interneuron migration assay, Sean Bian, uh, the uh, tumor model with many collaborators. And these are the organizations that fund our work. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Jürgen, for this very convincing talk about the usefulness and the future of organoids. Uh, questions? Yes? So, um, very, very nice talk. So, um, because there's not enough questions, we should ask more questions. Um, one of them is this one. So, the previous talk, they showed that you can put um, iPSC-derived cells or even um, pieces of organoids into mice, right? So, you show very clearly that the mouse is not a human. So, do you think for a lifetime we have to, like, let go of mice and try to make better organoids to, to let go of that system? Or is part of the answer to like combine both? Because mm -hmm. in the end, if you would put some of those cells in a, mm -hmm. in a mouse brain, you would have blood vessels, you would have polarity, mm -hmm. you would have interactions with some of it, you would have an immune system. Right. And so, yeah. mm -hmm. so, 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 I mean, the, the simple answer is it depends on what you want to study, right? The more complex answer is I'm the last one to say we're at the end of mouse genetics. That's total, that's total nonsense. I know there are some people out there who actually sell organoids as a replacement for uh, animal experiments. I think that's total nonsense. And by the way, whoever believes that should actually look how matrigel is made. It's made in animals. And so this is not the end of animal experiments, right? So that's very clear. Uh, and, and, uh, I, I, but I'm not absolutely sure whether the combination combination of the two is the right way. Um, my feeling is that organoids are a system under development. And that's why I feel it is extremely important to include the develop, uh, uh, a technology development part in lifetime. At the moment, uh, we can simulate microcephaly, cancer, but not schizophrenia or autism or God knows what, right? But uh, if you ask me, I think that in, in, within the next, at least within the life of lifetime, uh, those technologies will be developed. This is a very rapidly evolving field with, from day to day, the protocols get better. Um, I think transplantation into the mouse is great, but it brings us back to where we were before, right? So then we are generating an additional artifact, which is the fusion of uh, human tissue with a mouse tissue, the intracellular, the, 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 the precise milieu. I mean, like human organoids don't grow in the mouse tissue culture media. They just don't, right? Um, and then, and then we, 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 we bring this back. I think the uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very nice way of doing proof of concept experiments. So, for example, to test what would be the effect of vascularization. But ultimately, uh, uh, I, I, I can take a bet uh, on whether vascularization organoids will be possible. I, I predict, uh, I, I promise you that in the next 10 years it will be possible. So, we will overcome those things. Maybe not me, but the field. Okay, so there's a question here first. <clears throat> Hello, thank you very much for your, your great talk. I have a couple of questions actually. One is more or less on the same line and is mostly related to the fact that, as you are aware, there are several uh, um, prenatally programmed disease. And in the context of prenatal programmed disease, uh, brain development is also susceptible to the environmental milieu, the environmental uh, milieu <coughs> of the fetus itself and of the mother. And this is something that I don't know if you're willing to cope eventually in the future because the risk of using organoids is also that you're making a very simplistic model in which you're disregarding completely the context in which the fetus actually grows. Mm -hmm. And the second question is whether you recapitulate any brain structure in your 
system because as far as I'm concerned, for instance, the hypothalamus really doesn't grow that well mm -hmm. in, in the dish. And this is also relevant for several metabolic diseases. So. Right, right. So, so, so I think there were several questions. Number one is, I think, a prenatal... Uh, 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 um, so, so I think collaboration between organoid technology and a prenatal diagnosis, is, it can be very fruitful. We are working together with a prenatal MRI clinic that actually diagnoses the formation of uh, the first axon tracts in vivo and then uh, uh, by, by obtaining uh, 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 um, patient cells from patients where this is defect, we actually um, uh, 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 then generate uh, organoids. But one other thing is, I showed you this interneuron, I mean, just to illustrate how this type of research could, could evolve, right? We have used this interneuron migration assay. We've tested a number of neurotransmitters that told us that actually some of them have an effect, and it's totally different ones from what you would have predicted on the mouse experiments. We're now going back to patient cohorts, and we're doing a survey uh, on, on uh, whether the use of, because these, these, these neurotransmitters are, are druggable and a lot of patients are using drugs against that, and, and to ask whether that had any effect uh, in the MRI studies that were done clinically. So these are studies that you can do with the, um, with the organoids. And then your, 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 your uh, so, so basically the answer is no, we don't have the precise milieu, but we can test milieu compounds, for example, alcohol. Or, 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 or antidepressants, or for example, uh, in, in, the, in the interneuron migration assay, we have used an inhibitor against CXCR4, um, which had a very strong effect that was not predicted from the mouse. Um, and then you were, you were asking for the hypothalamus. It's true, hypothalamus is, 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 is uh, very difficult to make. There is a protocol from Yoshiki Society's lab, um, and there is, uh, but nevertheless, people have used hypothalamus-like tissue to recapitulate the projection from the cortex to the um, thalamus. But there's one thing I wanted to say here is um, any model is an approximation to the truth. I am not saying that we are closer to the truth than a mouse model, but what I do want to say is that we are orthogonal. We are getting other elements of the real truth, of the complete understanding of a human disease, and I think that's the value of this. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have time for two more quick questions uh, and quick answer, please. Uh, yes, one more. Okay, so I have a question about microglia, because as you know, the microglia comes from yolk sac. Mm -hmm. They develop together with the brain, mm -hmm. uh, with the n nervous system, mm -hmm. so it's, and they participate in apoptos uh, apoptotic cell death of neurons, synapse pruning, and synapse shaping. So how can Absolutely. organoid well develop without microglia? So this was one question. A second one is, do you think that uh, monocytes from the blood would be the best source to generate microglia? Mm -hmm. And then include microglia as a partner in the organoid. Yeah. So I mean, there's, there's published uh, protocols out there. We, we we are doing this routinely in the lab. Generate microglia from iPS cells. You just turn iPS iPS cells into. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, so that, that there's there's protocols that actually can be used to 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 to, to actually do that. You can mix them into the um, organoids and can. Uh, make that. I just, just one thing about the synaptogenesis, that it's absolutely true that microglia play a very important role, but I should say that so far, you know, uh, as far as I know, all studies on synaptogenesis that use human cells were done without microglia. So I think we are, we are, we, we have the possibility to make, to make a big step. Again, you know, it's not perfect, but I would, what I want to argue is that it's a lot better than what we had before. Okay, last question, quickly. Um, sorry, I'm not a neurobiologist, but I'm vaguely aware of uh, research on the connectome and uh, mapping uh, the graph or the network of which brain cells uh, connect to which. So I was just wondering if, um, if this network structure is somehow similar to the connections made in the organoid between the neurons or if it's uh, totally different. Or... Yeah, so this I think is the current forefront of, of, of organoid science. I know there's uh, labs, including my own, that are working on, on connectomics projects in the organoids. Um, the only thing I can tell you, it is, it is not, it's definitely in the current form of organoids, it is not identical. Just, just to remind you, right, we don't have an optic lobe uh, or, or, or a prefrontal cortex, we have cortex in the organoid, right? So we don't have the individual areas. But there is, there is solutions for this, and that's currently being developed. And I think in a year or two, there will be a couple of papers that come out on that. 
Okay, thank you very much, Shogun. So we need to move on. Um, so to continue with this idea of... Thank you.